good? Yep. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Actually, the host plant of the Gulf Lake area. 
So it's wonderful, it draws in those butterflies, but it also produces a fruit once it's matured. Uh, wisteria, those are blooming right now. Those are not native. There are some native wisterias, but, um, and then we also have clematis as some examples. Now you have annuals and you have perennials. Of course, annuals, uh, these are, annuals and perennials are used as our bedding plants. These are the ones that are gonna provide the most color. Annuals just mean that they're gonna complete their life cycle in a year. And those are usually the showiest, because think about it. You've got one life to live, you've got one year to live, what are you gonna do? You're gonna flower. So those are things like impatiens, marigolds, petunias, coleus, and zinnias. This is what brings most of the color to our landscapes. We can utilize these in containers. Uh, if you have an area in your landscape that you wanna change out color very often, it's gonna be your annuals. And this is a great way to utilize plants that are new, because right, we have plant breeders that are constantly working to improve uh, and make better plants that are showier, have more flowers, um, more disease tolerant, more pest tolerant, things like that. Perennials has a life cycle of more, uh, it will come back year after year, so more than two years. Uh, those can be woody. Uh, but they're also herbaceous, and some examples are daylilies, lilies, and iris. Ornamental grasses, I've really fallen in love with ornamental grasses. I think they're great. These are actually, uh, the plumage is the flower portion. So here we have a large pompous grass, and then we've got all sorts of different grasses that they have here. Um, but grasses typically bloom in the fall. They create nice screens and borders so they can be utilized for that. When we're thinking of plant materials, we want to think about their uses. Trees obviously are taller. They're great um, to provide shade for your home, right? And then if you have deciduous trees that drop their leaves, that'll actually, in the wintertime, allow the heat from the sun to radiate your house and make it warm. So utilizing plants in order to help, right, reduce energy costs, provide shade, and what have you for your home. Um, ornamental grasses can be annuals or perennials. Um, most of them grow very well in warm climates. So here in Louisiana, you, um, we have lots of grasses to choose from. Specimen plants are typically something that just is gorgeous, right? This is a specimen. This is gonna be a focal point. Here we have a Japanese maple. Those have gorgeous color in the fall. They usually have a nice open um, branching that make them very unique. So when we're talking about specimen plants, I'm thinking of things like Japanese magnolias, things that flower, things that are just gonna be a focal point in your landscape. Uh, they, they typically have a unique form, so maybe a weeping type of plant, texture and color. And they can also be standalone, like, hey, look at me. That's what a specimen plant typically is called. All right, and then a group of plantings. That just consists of several different species of shrubs, and uh, they kind of overlap. And you can use coarser or finer textures to kind of add a visual, you know, aesthetic. And they grow all together to kind of create this huge mass. And this is great if you don't want to worry about weeds. Right? When we provide space between plants, we provide more uh, sunlight to be available for weeds to pop up. So having those group plantings actually kind of prevents them from getting too large. They kind of contain themselves and then it reduces the amount of weeds. So as you can see here, everybody's just kind of growing on top of one another. So this is just what we consider a group planting. Now we also have foundation plantings and what that means is that it typically follows the foundation of the house. So this is what typical homes will have, have beds, hopefully not too close to the house, right? Because we have to pro provide enough room for the plants to grow, but it kind of just brings your visual, it, it can follow the house, right? So it follows the beds of the house. And those are typically, you have trees in back, shrubs towards the middle, and then your shorter plants towards the front. Um, it helps tie the landscape to your house. So it looks like a, a nice visual, um, it's not broken up. Um, all right, today we're gonna to talk about plant materials that we utilize. Uh, 
And the Louisiana Super Plant Program is uh, something that we promote through the LSU Ag Center. These are, uh, it's just a, a way for us to tell homeowners and consumers about plants that have been tested by the university to, you know, show you that over time these plants have performed well. Annuals, perennials, we usually follow them for a couple of years. Um, shrubs and trees, obvious, for a much longer time, but every year they're going out, they're taking visual data, they're measuring. So this is data driven. Um, and we use it, then we promote those plants as superior plants that people know that they can buy and are going to perform well at their home anywhere throughout Louisiana. Uh, so for this year, the 2020 uh, Louisiana Super Plant releases that we have are, we're trying to work with a lot more natives uh, with our super plant program. We really love those highly cultivated cultivars, right, that plant breeders are working on to make sure that we're getting, you know, more fragrant, lots of flowers, what have you. But we also want to recognize plants that are tried and true and have been in our landscapes for quite some time, and we know that they're going to perform well, and natives are some of those. And Louisiana iris is one, just gorgeous, right? They're starting to bloom right now in the spring. This is typically when Louisiana iris bloom. Then we have summer of salvias. There's quite a few that you can select from. And ornamental peppers are going to be our fall release. So peppers typically begin producing their fruit. Remember, those are very warm season. They're going to start producing fruit in the summer and into the fall. So there are five species of Louisiana iris. Um, and they have, in nature and through breeding, have hybridized and created all sorts of new hybrids that just make some gorgeous colors. Look at this tantra is a um, kind of a mauve pink color that is really awesome. Uh, these are warm season bedding plants. They are perennial. They come back year after year. Uh, they typically are actively growing in the fall through the winter and then they bloom in the spring. Irises actually go dormant in the summertime and that's going to be when you want to divide them. So these spread by rhizomes and they clump, they'll kind of really start taking over an area. And around August, September is the time that you're going to want to divide those when they're dormant. And then you can share them with your friends. They multiply pretty easily. You can thin them out. Once they become overcrowded, they don't tend to bloom as often, so you want to make sure that you do thin, thin these out um, on a pretty regular basis. Now these grow best in full to partial sun. You're going to get the most blooms the more sun that you have. It has an upright habit. Again, they bloom in the spring. They don't have very much uh, maintenance, not a lot of pests, not a lot of disease. And I'm not going to say that for everything because the reason why they're typically selected as Louisiana super plants is because they are very, uh, they don't have disease, they're, they don't have a lot of pests, they're drought tolerant, they're heat tolerant, they're just tough plants that hold up really well throughout the state of Louisiana. Um, and what's great about iris, you know, these grow in water areas, right? So they can be used to stabilize soil along um, ponds and lakes, right? They tolerate standing water. So if you have an area in your lawn that's very low and gives you a lot of trouble, throw some iris in there. They'll help out, you know, you'll have some blooms, you'll have some plants that grow well there. Um, these can also be utilized in rain gardens. So they tolerate that water. They also tolerate drought very well too. So they can be planted just about anywhere and do well. Um, salvias, we're calling it the summer of salvias. There are so many that you can pick from. Uh, we have quite a few recommendations. These are a warm season bedding plant that are going to uh, typically bloom in the summer into the fall. Um, very low maintenance. They don't have a lot of water needs. It's a moderate water use. They attract pollinators, the hummingbirds, the butterflies, and bees. Just love it. They're very heat tolerant. They're long blooming, so they just continuously bloom, and they're very drought tolerant. This one here is called Rockin' Blue Suede Shoes. It has that deep blue, almost black colored flower, and it's, it's very gorgeous. Um, 
They get pretty tall, about 30 to 40 inches high. So if you're going to use these in a container setting, you, that would be your uh, your thriller, right? Kind of the centerpiece, the taller. Uh, all in the garden, you're going to want to set it back in your beds because it will be taller than some of your other plants. Uh, we also have, we're calling it the red, white, and blue summer color combo. You can use things like the Roman red salvia, and they'll be blooming perfectly around the 4th of July. You can use the Mystic Spires blue and crude, the white flame salvia. Again, we have that rock and blue suede shoes, and then there's a skyscraper orange that isn't really, it's an orange red. So you can kind of play with that theme and have that red, white, and blue summer of salvias. Um, for the fall, we have our ornamental peppers. They kind of clumped everything this year. Sometimes we pick cultivars that are very specific, right? And then the super plant committee, which I'm a member of, uh, has decided to utilize fruits. And for the fall, they've selected the ornamental peppers. And there are so many great ornamental peppers with catchy names. You know, these are going to start making peppers in the late summer into the fall. You can get colors that are so deep purple that they're almost black to those hot red, yellow, and orange colors. These are very drought tolerant. They're heat tolerant and they don't require a lot of deadheading. So it's just kind of one of those plants that we set and forget. Put them out there and don't worry too much about them. You don't need to worry about fertilizing or spraying or anything like that. Some of the recommended uh, varieties are Midnight Fire, Black Hawk, Hot Pops, Purple and Chili Chili. I love that one. It's so cute. I have a picture of it. Calico. And then there are a couple of edible ones. Now remember that our ornamental peppers are ornamental. They're meant to be grown for their ornamental value, right? So they're just very pretty. Um, but there are a couple that are edible. I think these are edible. They're not going to hurt you, but they're not bred for being tasty, right? So they're bred for their beautiful colors. Um, Mad Hatter and Candy Cane Red. So here's just a couple. This is that Mad Hatter. You see why it gets that name? It's kind of this, I don't know, blown out cover is what it looks like. It kind of flattened out. So you get these greens that turn to yellows and reds and orange. So that's the Mad Hatter, and that one's actually an edible. Chili Chili is my favorite. Just look at how it's like fire. It looks like little flames. I think it's so beautiful with all the yellow, red, and oranges. Midnight Fire might be hard to tell, but this one's uh, got that purple foliage, so it brings that interest. It's got the lime and red and orange colored peppers. And then we have the calico, and it's called calico because it's got that variegation in the leaves. So you've got the purple and white and green, and then you get those red peppers on there. So it's interesting. It adds that pretty little spice to your garden. The 2021 selection for the Impatient Vegan Series, Sunflower, Sun Credible Yellow, Wooly grass, which is another uh, native ornamental grass, and then the Super Tuna Mini Vista Indigo. The, in, the Beacon Series Impatiens, now Impatiens can have issues with powdery mildew, God bless you, uh, but this is an improved variety that has more resistance to the mildew, so it, it, it's great. And it's very difficult to find a lot of flowers that bloom in shade. And impatiens are one of those selections that if you have a shaded area, you want to plant underneath a large tree. Uh, most other plants are not going to produce a whole lot of flowers, but the impatiens are one that you can utilize in a shaded area and still get a lot of color. They come in all the ranges, oranges, whites, purples, pinks, what have you. They, they bloom in the spring to late summer. Again, very low maintenance. They are resistant to that downy mildew, and these do well in containers. They do well in the bed. You can, these are short. Um, they've got that mounded, upright growth habit, so you can use them as a border plant like they have here at the Hanley Research Station. They also do well in hanging baskets. Sunflower so incredible yellow. This is a beautiful, beautiful sunflower. It's multi-branch. So when we think of sunflowers, we often think of those single stem, really large heads, right? But these are multi-branched and multi-stem, so you get a lot of little yellow flowers. The pollinators just love them. They want full sun. Um, 
these are going to grow towards the back of the bed because they do get a little bit taller. They're continuous bloomers. They're disease resistant. They have fall interest because they're blooming from the summer into the fall, drought tolerant, and of course our pollinators just love them. They're, they're excellent. Lily grass are my favorites. We're going to get this uh, plumage in the fall so you can have this pink variety this is a native grass so it's going to be very low maintenance uh, the birds actually love to bed down in dormant ornamental grasses so i like to leave them i know a lot of people feel like you know when grasses turn brown they're not so pretty anymore and they want to cut them back but i often recommend that people just leave them right you can trim them right before they begin their new growth again in the spring but uh, when all those deciduous trees drop their leaves, birds like to use, utilize things like ornamental grasses to kind of bed down into in the winter time. They're very easy to grow. Uh, you want to put them in full sun if you want to get the most plumage. There's also a white variety that is very striking. And it's awesome when you put them in large uh, plantings like this. Instead of just having one specimen, it just makes, it's a very dramatic, um, I don't know, dramatic visual when you when you actually group several together. And the pollinator also loves these. So. Uh, Supertunium mini vista indigo. This is winter, early spring to mid fall when we can plant. Um, this is more of a spreading trailing type plant, does well in containers in fronts of beds as borders. Um, it has improved heat. Petunias typically peter out in the summertime, but they've made some of these to where they can tolerate the heat. And uh, the super tunia mini vista indigo is one of those. And it's got those deep purple, beautiful petunia. Wonderful. Um, likes more of an acidic soil, so grouped with other plants that like acids, such as camellias, azaleas, blueberries, things like that. Um, 2020 plants, we have the bald cypress, right, our state tree. Uh, people either love or hate bald cypress. You know, we were driving down from Baton Rouge, or driving, yeah, I guess we're driving down from Baton Rouge, and I love looking at the cypress trees that are in the swamp and, you know, pointing out the eagle's nest that's out there and stuff like that. I mean, these trees are beautiful. They, they're great for wildlife. They're good to help stabilize. Uh, around ponds, stabilized soil. They have that beautiful rust colored foliage in the fall, so it brings a fall interest. And you can actually, you know, it just creates that beautiful blanket of gorgeous fall foliage on the ground. You can utilize those needles as a mulch um, or, or compost them. So it's got a lot of great features. It's the knees that people you know, have concern with, and, and I completely understand that when we're using that in a landscaping situation, that can be a problem, especially when it's breaking up your neighbor's concrete. Uh, luckily with cypress, if you cut the knees while they're still young, it doesn't hurt the tree, and you know, when they can be held back, let's say. They can be um, cut back, and you can get around that, and it doesn't hurt the tree. But you want to be conscious of that when you plant them. You're not going to plant a bald cypress right next to your house. We have bald cypress at the house. We also have a pond. We have them planted out by the pond. So just be wary of that if you choose to do that. Um, there is a breeder at Stephen F. Austin who has actually, hopefully, he has a variety that does not produce these. And maybe one day that I'll get them on. Uh, American Beautyberry which is a shrub, another native plant, Flanker coleus and Lucky Star Pintas. So ball cypress obviously is a, a native plant. It's native to the Southeast United States. Uh, it's a deciduous conifer. Again, it'll drop its needles in the fall. Slow growing and long lived. Uh, it, it grows well in wet areas. So if you have a low area in your landscape, these can be utilized there, also in rain gardens. They can get about 50 to 70 feet in height. They love full sun, but can tolerate the shade. And it attracts birds, right? They do have some fruit, 
and they do tolerate place oil, which we have a great deal of at my house, can be a penny. Wet soil, and they're tolerant of air pollution, so it can be utilized in those types of situations. Here we have a picture of a eagle, right, up in the ball cypress tree. Here's those knees, right? They're going to produce more knees typically when they're in a wet area. In a drier area, they're not. So I don't think that scientists still fully understand why tall cypress produce knees, but they do think it is for stabilization to help them to grow in areas like this. But of course, it's, it's very important for wildlife habitat. It's very valued for timber, right? And it's really good for wetland stability, for soaking up floodwaters, and preventing erosion. And they also trap pollutants, so they're very good for the environment. American Beeberry, one of my favorites. Um, here you see them, they're an understory shrub. So they are native to, uh, to Louisiana, to the southeastern United States. They are a deciduous shrub. They do produce flowers in the summertime, but they're very inconspicuous. They're tiny, just these little purple pink flowers that give way to these gorgeous purple fruit and why it's called the American Beautyberry. It tolerates all soil types. It's a tough plant. It can be planted in full sun or partial shade, but it does like to be under some, it, it's an understory shrub. So that means it grows under trees very well. And it's got that spread, spreading, open, airy kind of habit that made it, I think, just gorgeous. Here we're off at LSU's campus, and it's growing under live oak trees here. So um, the benefit, it is a native species, so good ecosystem services. The berries come out in the late summer and in the fall, and it supports several wildlife species. So you hear this, you, here you see this black throated blue wobbler eating the berries, right? And they transplant pretty easily. We were in St. Tammany and we dug some up <laughs> and transplanted them in our backyard. But you can also buy them in the nursery pretty readily. And there are some white alba, uh, Cal Carbo Americana, American Beauty Berry variety. So if you like white berries, you can also find a white berry. But again, see this kind of open, airy growth habit just make it interesting. It has been used, so I did quite a bit of medicinal plant research when I got my doctorate. I worked on medicinal plants, so I often like to look at plants for their medicinal purposes. And Native Americans uh, utilize this, Cajuns utilize American beauty. They would take the leaves, branches, and roots, and they used it to treat malaria and rheumatism. Um, the roots were used to treat dizziness, stomach aches, and dysentery, and a combination of the roots and the berries were boiled into a tea to treat colic, so those kinds of issues. Today, there is research with it uh, being studied for treatment of inflammation, rheumatism, diabetes, and gastrointestinal bleeding. So, uh, also, Mississippi State has utilized American Beauty Berry to make an insect repellent. In fact, people used to take the leaves and crush them, rub them on their skin, or for their horses, they would put them uh, underneath their saddles and, and rub them on their skin to kind of deter uh, biting insects. So, I mean, it's it's not just beautiful, it's also got those types of things that we can use them for. It has other uses. Um, we have for 2020, these releases, again, the flame grower coleus, just a gorgeous, now these will produce flowers in the late summer, but that's not why we grow coleus. We like coleus because of its foliage. It creates all these different, interesting foliage with beautiful different colors. There's so many different color combinations. Some of them do produce a flower when they do. It's almost a true blue color, and people typically cut those back. Um, then we have the Lucky Sarpentas. These are very gorgeous, wonderful for pollinators. The butterflies just love them. And lots of different colors. So I'm not going to have as much information and detail on all of these, and we're going to kind of go through these a little bit quicker. Um, for 2019, we had the Lemon Sedum. I remember that year when it was released. I went out and got some, and ours is still at our house. We use it. 
It's very low growing, so it's more of a ground cover. And it produces, it, it's just, it creates this mat, essentially. And it's great because if it grows very well together, no weeds. Now, if you get some space between it, the weeds can come up. And you know how hard it is to remove weeds from ground covers. It's hard to, to pull them out without damaging the plant. But if you space them very closely, they create this beautiful mat. And as long as we don't have a hard freeze, they just stay. And in the spring, they actually have tiny little yellow flowers that the pollinators, the bees especially love. So if you're looking to attract more pollinators or bees to your lawn, lemon sedum is a good one. Uh, but we do grow it for its foliage, and it's kind of that lime green chartreuse color, and it's very fine. So it adds texture to your landscape. Uh, the lime sizzler firebush is actually native to Florida. I think they discovered this at a nursery in, in Texas. But it's, again, that year they just love that lime green chartreuse colors because the foliage is chartreuse and then it's got those beautiful orange blossoms that the hummingbirds really like. So this is another pollinator attractor. And then the Jolt di series dianthus. If you have not grown Jolt dianthus at your house, do yourself a favor and try it next fall. It is gorgeous. It would it is a cool season annual bedding plant. So it's going to grow best in the fall through the winter and into the spring. And dianthus typically doesn't do very well in the summertime. But these are on very tall sticks and they're multi-clustered and they're just beautiful. They make excellent cut flowers. So if you like to bring in cut flowers at your house, try, try the Jolt Dianthus series. They're beautiful. Very phenomenal. Alright, here's that lemon seed on the seed creates that mat. So if you, if you put them close enough together, you're not going to get a whole lot of weeds. It'll just create that border. And you, if you want to have a border along your beds, you can utilize lemon sedum. That's how I have it in my house. Um, it's very heat and drought tolerant. It's just one tough plant. It's a, a very good performer. So full sun, the more sun it gets, the more chartreuse it is. Uh, if you get it in the shade, it's going to have more of a green color. It's not that lime, lime green. The lime sizzler firebush, again, this one is a summer fall interest, so these will bloom in the summertime. Again, these attract hummingbirds and different pollinators. This is a shrub. It will die back in the wintertime. It's more tropical, but it is perennial, so it comes back every year from its roots and just has that beautiful yellow chartreuse color. The lime is mixed in there, and then those orange flowers just make it very interesting. Um, it's very heat tolerant. It's got that foliage interest, and again, the hummingbirds just love it. The Jolt Dianthus series, again, that we talked about, this is that cherry, just a very deep purple, um, not deep purple, deep pink. It's, it's very beautiful. And then they have the pink magic dianthus. These again have those tall sable stems with multi-clustered heads, so it makes an excellent cut flower. And these do best for fall interest, okay? Fall, winter, and into the spring. 2018, we have the Intense Classic Solution. This has that hot pink, beautiful foliage. We have these planted around our, uh, our mailbox, and they get pretty tall. The bees just love it, especially bumblebees. In fact, the, the mailman or mailwoman left us a note in our mailbox that said, please remove the plants because of the bumblebees. I guess I, maybe they were allergic or worried about being stung because if you want to attract bees, utilize this plant. They love it. They absolutely love it. And it's just gorgeous, very unique flower. Then we have the little gem magnolia, which is a great foundation tree for around the house because it's kind of, it's a dwarfed uh, southern magnolia. So it's been bred to be smaller, not quite as large. And it has those beautiful white flowers in the springtime. Now, this is dwarf, but it can still get 30 to 40 feet. We're just not talking 80 feet, right? Um, and it has those evergreen leaves that have the, the brown fuzzy on the back. Uh, some people dislike that because those leaves don't break down very well. 
So when they do drop some of their leaves, it can be a little irritating, but they compost very easily and you can cut them up with the lawnmower just fine. And then we have that lime-like hydrangea, which is one of the panicle hydrangeas. Stunning, white, gorgeous, great for cut flowers. They can tolerate full sun, whereas other garden hydrangeas need a little bit more shade. These do well in the full sun and they are spectacular at the end of summer, going into the fall, a great shrub, foundation shrub for around the home. Um, here's that intense lotion, just that very unique flower head. It's hot pink, really cute. If, if you're, I don't know how many of you have been to Baton Rouge or do Spanish Town, hot pink is like their color. I can imagine this being an all of them there. They have abundant long, long lasting flowers, but again, attractive bees and butterflies. So if you want pollinators, this is what you want to get. Uh, that lime white hydrangea has the beautiful white flower. Again, these make great cut flowers. This is a deciduous shrub, and it gets about six to eight feet tall. A number of shrubs are about as tall as they are wide, so they can. <laughs> Uh, get pretty large. You want to plant these. If, if you want a visual <coughs> impact, plant several of them. It, it's stunning. The, again, little Jim Magonia, the dwarf cultivar of the native southern Magonia. <coughs> they do get up upwards of about 30 feet, but these are evergreen, so if you want that year-round interest for your house with some flowers thrown in there in the spring, try a little little Jim Magonia. And those flowers are very fragrant, right? You know, they're gorgeous. I hope you give them all the time. We're good. Louisiana Super Plants for 2017. We have another one of our native plants. So if you're looking for a native shrub, this one is a deciduous shrub that makes these beautiful botanical flowers in the spring. And um, that's the Henry's Garden at Virginia Willow. Sun Patience, and then we have the Vista Supertunia Bubblegum. So the Henry's Garden, again, is a native shrub, so it's going to be very disease tolerant. It doesn't have a lot of issues. It is deciduous to semi evergreen, so if here in New Orleans, it may likely not drop its leaves at all, right? So um, it has the, the reason it's called garnet is because in the fall it has that beautiful fall foliage change and it's that garnet crimson color. Now it does have um, these beautiful white flowers in the spring and it's of course attractive to the pollinators and this one's a great selection. It's not too tall. It gets about four to five feet. It likes, it's another understory tree, uh, shrub, so if you have larger trees in your landscape and you want to have some shrubs that you grow underneath it, Henry's Garnet would be a good selection. It likes that, you know, kind of woodland garden, filtered sunshade setting that will perform well in that. Sun Patience Hybrid. Impatience we don't typically think of growing in the sun. Remember we talked about the Beacon Series Impatience? They do well in the shade, providing flowers and, and foliage that do well for shade. These have been bred to tolerate the sun, and they're very tropical. They've got larger leaves and they've large, bright, vibrant flowers. They're just gorgeous. They do well in containers and hanging baskets and in the landscape. They prefer a well-drained uh, soil, so you're not going to put them in an area that gets a lot of water. They're a great hybrid and patient for full sun. In the landscape. Um, there's about 15 different color varieties available. They're just a great selection. The Vista Super Tunia Bubblegum Petunia, if you are looking for the super duper Petunia, this is the one. It, it just grows. You can get one small planting and it trails and trails and trails and take over. Do any of y'all grow this event? Yeah. Isn't it awesome? Yeah, I just got it. So I'm, I'm like, it, it, it lasted the winter. So it's, um, but yeah, it, it's never stopped blooming. Uh huh. And watch, watch this summer. Now they don't draw, uh, tolerate being dry for very long. I have one in a hanging basket at the house, and I find that I have to water it very often. So, um, but it will do well in the landscape. You can trim this. It's going to get big, and it's going to go crazy. You, I mean, you can see it from. Uh, there's a professor. At, 
Mississippi State, Gary Bachman, who has these. And you, you know how they have the Google Maps, right, of your house, and you look it up? You can see his super genius, just all pink everywhere, because he has that. The genies typically don't tolerate heat very well. They're more of a cool season annual bedding plant, but these are improved, and so they tolerate the heat a much better. So they'll last through the summertime. All right, and now we're gonna fly through the rest. So these are just the rest of the selections. I kind of highlighted the ones over the last six, seven years that have been released as super plants. Uh, this program has been in, I don't know, around for about 20 years, so we have quite a few selections. Um, here's some more warm season flowering plants. See, the, the list is long. Now when we're thinking of uh, salvias, Again, these are great bedding plants for the summertime. Remember, this summer is the summer of salvias. Salvia evolution white and violet were our selection at one point. These are great. Again, that purple color, the white. These do have some powdery mildew issues on occasion. If you have them in a very low-lying area that gets a lot of water, uh, it can be an issue. But the pollinators just love these, and they are perennial, so they'll come back year after year. They are an excellent selection. Um, Serenita, raspberry, angelonia, these are just so cute. I love the flower heads, they're very unique. They're called the uh, snapdragon of the summer. Because you know, typically snapdragons are growing in the, in the fall when the season is cooler, fall into the winter and spring, but then they don't do well in the summertime. Well, if you like that type of flower, you can do uh, angelonia in the summertime. And these are profuse blooms. I mean, look at this. There's just so many flowers. Gorgeous. It makes quite an impact. They don't require deadheading, so just set them and forget them, right? Put them out there, they're gorgeous. We have, it's cut off there, but these are called the bathing wing begonias. If you're looking for flowers for a shaded area or somewhere uh, underneath a tree you want to utilize as a ground cover, these are excellent. They have these glossy leaves. You can get colors from white, pink, red. Wonderful in containers, great in hanging baskets. And again, these do well in shade. They're going to be great in the full sun. Bandana lantanas, these can get huge. Uh, gorgeous. Great for the landscape, very woody. They're perennial. They can get pretty tall. They can get several feet in height and width. They will die back in a hard freeze. Uh, they come back year after year from the trees, and they are profuse bloomers. They do have some issues with lacewing bugs. Sometimes in the summer when it's very hot, but you can control those with horticultural oils and or sprays like that. Um, profuse bloomers, and again, the butterflies and pollinators just love these. And there's all sorts of color combinations. You know, here we have the typical pink and yellow, but there are reds, there are whites, all sorts of different color combinations. Butterfly pintas, again, another great pollinator plant. This may actually be a photo from my garden. Um, profuse bloomer, blooms in the summertime. It is perennial unless we have like a very, very, very tough breeze then it will take out the roots. Um, it's annual in more northern climates. But the pollinators just love these, right? And these come in all sorts of colors, pinks, reds, and whites. Little Ruby, Alternanthera, or Joseph, St. Joseph's Coat, right? Or Joseph's Coat. Joseph's Coat. Joseph's Coat, not St. Joseph. Yeah, that's kind of the common name. Yes, exactly. Uh, Grown for its foliage, no flowers. Right, just gets that burgundy color. There are some variegated, uh, but this is the little ruby, so you have that bonnet kind of red colored foliage. Very nice. Cinerita, Rosalita, Cleanomy. Some of these are a mouthful. They have those beautiful purple flowers, has been a Louisiana super plant. Perennial pollinators love it. Uh, it gets pretty tall, so as you can see, you're going to plant that towards the back of the bed. Right? These do well in containers as well. Here's just a close-up of those clusters of flowers. They're, they're gorgeous, and they are profuse bloomers. 
Here's the Sonera angelinia, just another variety of angelinia, that summer snapdragon. Very profuse, glossy green leaves, a great performer for the summer time. Lunar hibiscus, this is uh, the lunar series hibiscus, a hardy hibiscus, so that means that it will tolerate frost, right, or tolerate our cold winters. It'll come back year after year. It has those large, large flowers, beautiful whites, reds, pinks. This is also a Louisiana native. It's also known as the swamp mallow. mallow. So another great woody ornamental shrub that you can utilize in the garden for pollinators and just gorgeous colors. All right, so yeah, swamp red mallow, hardy hibiscus, the butterflies just love it. And look at all these blooms. It's just so gorgeous. They're huge. They're huge. And these can be utilized in a low area in your in your yard or rain gardens because they tolerate that standing water. Oh, these were also used for medicinal purposes in Louisiana. All parts of the plants were used to make a tea that would treat colds and whooping cough. Today there's in, uh, current research for its anti-diabetic, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer uh, properties. And it's also been used for cardiovascular, liver, and visual function. So, uh, it can be utilized for medicine and grown for its beauty. The kawaii terrenias, these actually another great plant if you have a shaded area that you want to get some flowers, you know, bring some color to a shaded area. The terrenias are a great selection. They also tolerate full sun. It's not a green here. Whites, purples, pinks, all the colors. Got that kind of trumpet-shaped flower. Very gorgeous. Panicolius, I really like this one. I burned this one too. Chartreuse and maroon, very beautiful. Not maroon for its flower, just for this beautiful foliage. Fireworks fountain grass. So this is Penicillium. It'll get these beautiful plumes in the fall, and it has that gorgeous garnet colored leaf blade. Very nice for the summertime. These will come back year after year. Save this one fast. Flutterby Petite Tutti Fruity Pink Butterfly Bush. Okay, so this is a buddleia, and it gets the beautiful clusters. It's obviously called a butterfly bush because butterflies love them, and it comes in just this color. Uh, the purple lavender look. It's very good. It's another one of those perennial shrubs that come back every year. It's about three to four feet in height. A great performer. So if you're doing some pollinator gardening and you want to attract pollinators, Try to flutter by the teeth too for me. All right, some more flowering shrub, shrubs. Mrs. Schiller's Delight by Burnham is a native evergreen shrub. Um, if you've had Indian hawthorns in your landscape that are not doing well because they get leaf spot, you want something that's evergreen and it produces flowers in the spring, here's your replacement. Okay, so if you're having any issues with Indian hawthorn, this is a native. It's got gorgeous white flower clusters. It is evergreen. It's small. It can be used as a foundation shrub, right, that has that spring interest. It tolerates poor, tough soils. So it's, it's just, it's a performer, and it looks really good. Aphrodite, Althea, Rose of Sharon is what it's commonly called, kind of one of those antique southern gems that people have been growing for ages. The Aphrodite Althea is more tree-like. This is a shrub, but it gets pretty tall. And then it has those beautiful hibiscus-type flowers in the summer into the fall. The Belinda's Dream Rose, if you're looking for a tough rose that is a profuse bloomer and you like pink, this one is more resistant to black spot. Roses typically get a lot of fungal diseases, but Belinda's Dream holds up pretty good. And it's very fragrant. It's, it's a beautiful Rose. Conversation piece of William has this pink and mottled light pink. Another great shrub. These are deciduous, will drop their leaves, but you know, they spring in the spring. <laughs> they bloom in the springtime. That's what I'm trying to say. 
The drift resins, there are seven varieties. I think they've added, added a few more, but these are dwarf resins, right? And they are continuous bloomers, so they're not, they are deciduous, they drop their leaves. Um, well, if we don't have a hard winter, they will keep their leaves. They're semi-evergreen, that's what we'll call them. But they are profuse, little small flowers. They have all the colors, pinks, oranges, whites. I love the coral. We had coral at my house. And um, they'll bloom, bloom in the spring all the way through the fall. Frostproof gardenia. Gardenia is another one of those southern gems that we, we hold on to, like the magnolias and azaleas. It's just tried and true. It's evergreen. It's got those glossy leaves. They keep them year round. They're small, kind of delicate, and they're beautiful white, fragrant, fragrant flowers in the springtime. Another one of those small evergreen shrubs that you can use for uh, foundation plantings or in your house. Shishi Gashir Camellia is gorgeous. There's a white shishi now. These are evergreen. They are dwarf camellias. They're Camellia sasangua. They tolerate full sun. They bloom in the fall and they keep their glossy evergreen leaves. There are some issues with T-scale uh, on occasion, but these are great performers. If you are looking for another small foundation shrub that brings fall interest in flowers, Shishi Gashira is a sure one. Leslie and Camellia is more of an upright tree that has these light pink and white flowers and yellow centers. Another great camellia variety. There are thousands and thousands of camellias. So to be selected for a super plant, they're probably a really good performer. And uh, Leslie Ann is one of those. Penny Mac garden hydrangeas. We talked about the panicle hydrangea, the, the limelight, the white. These are the garden hydrangeas. So remember, these are going to need some shade. They don't tolerate full sun. They like a more acid soil. Um, again, if you have an acid soil, you'll get more of the pink colors. If it's more of an alkaline, you'll get the blue flowers. So, but these are great. Deciduous shrubs, small, will lose their leaves in the winter time, but come back year after year, and they spring, uh, they bloom in the spring. Right like blueberries, I think we're gonna try and include more edible plants. So this is a, a shrub that produces, obviously, fruit, blueberries. We've got the Brightwell, Tiffany, Climax, and Premier. If you, these can be utilized as landscape plants. Uh, they have beautiful fall foliage change. They, they get yellow, red, and orange foliage. They are deciduous and they drop their, their leaves and then you get fruit in the springtime or summertime. They, they flower in the spring and produce fruit in the summertime. And if you want to produce blueberries, you want to make sure that you're using more than one variety. You need cross-pollination for blueberries. For them to produce. So full sun. The more sun, the more flowers, the more berries can be utilized as a landscape shrub as well. All right, and then we've got trees, and I will release y'all. We have the willow oak. We don't have a whole lot of trees on our super plant list. We're working to get more. Uh, all of these, besides the Shoal Creek Vitex, these are natives, so they will perform well. We have the willow oak. These are the trees that we have growing in our house around our pond. They do well in heavy clay soils, wet soil, and they're very tolerant of air pollution. So would make good shade trees, um, street trees, and can be utilized in rain gardens. No maintenance, just put them in the ground. You don't need to do anything. No trimming, no fertilizing. A great tree. They are deciduous. They lose their leaves in the winter time. They have these fine leaves, right? So not too large. And they grow very fast. So if you're looking, you just built a house and I need shade, you can get a willow oak and they'll turn pretty quickly and they provide shade. Southern sugar maple, excellent fall foliage change. We don't get a whole lot of that here, right? In Louisiana, I'm a little jealous, but these do and they're native and they have those beautiful maple leaves. These are great deciduous native trees. They're underutilized for sure. Um, and they're adapted to all sorts of soils. So just a, a great tree. Here we have the fall foliage change. We'll go first to yellow and then 
get this nice dark red color. All right, evergreen sweet bay magnolia. This is another native tree. Evergreen, it does drop leaves, it sheds leaves. It makes small flowers, small fragrant flowers, and it has this showy fruit. The squirrels and birds just love to eat. Um, it's kind of great. These leaves on the backside are silver, so when it's windy, it's, it's pretty. So they're native to Southeast United States. They're a smaller tree, so it could be used as a foundation tree. You don't want it too close to the house. Uh, it does tolerate place, wet soils and air pollution, so it makes an excellent tree, uh, foundation tree, street tree. It can be utilized in a rain garden. And then lastly, we have our Shoal Creek Vitex, or the chase tree. Now, uh, crepe girls have, have been having some issues with crepe girl bark scale, and people are looking for some flowering ornamental plants to replace their crepe girls with. Shoal Creek Vitex is an excellent selection. It comes in more than one, well, the Shoal Creek is specifically this bluish purple color. But there are some other varieties of chase tree or vitex trees. They have a white, they have a pink. So if you're experiencing any issues and you want to have a flowering tree for your yard, if you're having issues with crepe myrtle, I would recommend a vitex as a replacement. And the pollinators love these. They get maybe, you know, 15, 20 feet in height when they're fully mature. They're deciduous, they will drop their leaves, but a great specimen plant for your on. All right, and that's all I have for you guys today. If you want more information on Louisiana super plants,